Hello and welcome. This is a recording of the webinar I presented on 17th of June 2020. I'm Guy Osmond, I'm Managing Director of Osmond Group Limited. You probably know us as Osmond Ergonomics, which is our main trading activity. We've been in the business of workplace ergonomics, well-being, and office furniture supply and specialist equipment for people with musculoskeletal problems for nearly 30 years now. But I've never seen anything like this. So we're going to be talking about, sorry, wrong one. Still the wrong one, there we go. Uh, we're going to be re talking about what I've termed post-lockdown, the three phases of workforce accommodation. So the first comment I may make is this is current, I hope, as at the time I'm recording it, but obviously this is very much a moving event. Goalposts are moving constantly, so it may all be completely irrelevant or out of date by the time you watch this, but let's think of it as a snapshot. I've also specifically used the word accommodation here because I'm thinking not only of the physical accommodation, whether that's for people returning to the office or the workplace or people working at home, but also accommodating the needs of those individuals. So what I'm going to talk about is, if I let, see if I can click it correctly this time, yes I have. Uh, my agenda today, brief introduction of the setting for this presentation to give it some context, then the three phases we have seen so far, how we describe them and what we term them, which are phase one, wrap it in the headlights, phase two, getting a grip, and then phase three, command and control. And then I'm going to sum up usually with a slightly conspicuous and obvious plug for our own services and products, but also a load of free resources and equipment that, you're, uh, that may be of interest to you. So as an introduction, first of all, we've obviously been providing and supplying to organisations throughout the UK for about 27, 28 years now. And obviously this is very new to all of us and the whole scenario has moved very fast and organizations have responded in varying ways and with various levels of capability, knowledge and experience. And so hopefully this will give you a bit of an insight into perhaps where you are on that course or organizations you're working with where they are and give you some ideas about how you may be able to contribute to that. So rabbit in the headlights, obviously we all were completely overwhelmed by this. I've said unprepared rather than levels of preparedness. I know there were a very small proportion of organizations who had prepared their business continuity plans and all the essentials that they needed to deal with this completely in place. But the vast majority, majority of organizations and employers to a greater or lesser extent just weren't ready for the scale of this. So there was no budget available. And really significantly, although we all have, or most organizations have, the vast majority, I very much hope, if not all, have contingency plans for when bad stuff happens, continuity plans and so forth. Quite often, they tend to make quite unknowingly, perhaps, assumptions that perhaps this will only relate to a fire in one building or a hacking of this computer system or the IT servers going down but actually for everything to be hit, and for many organizations on a global basis, pretty much at the same time, that takes some real managing. So what we saw as organizations realized they were sort of running around a bit in various levels, a bit like a rabbit in the headlights, back and forth, not knowing which way to turn, not knowing what to do next, but slowly sort of coming to terms with what needed to be done. We saw very early on, those who were ahead of the game saying, right, we need to take some preliminary measures for this. We put some or most of our employees either home working or on furlough. We've got no budget for this, but we will have to allocate some and let's take some early measures. So in our context, that was a small, very small number of organizations starting to say, let's get some chairs sorted for home workers more were saying, well, let's get laptop kits, that's laptop stands, keyboards and mice. So they would have something for people to use at home and get organized. 
And there were a few rumors going around, actually probably not rumors, factual stories about organizations talking about needing thousands of chairs. But certainly in our case, none of those ever came to anything. And I, I think most organizations who were even testing the market with that initially were really sort of just sounding out options rather than having a particularly committed view that they need to rapidly deploy thousands of chairs across their entire home worker estate. What we saw a lot of organizations doing was adopting a suck it and see process. So actually saying, this is only gonna be a few weeks, let's see how it goes and we'll worry about it when we see whether or not people are coming back in a few weeks time. And that applied probably to the majority, I would say, of organizations or at different levels. Some were making early stage movements on the action, but there was a lot of people saying, well, this is all happening too fast. We're not really geared up for this. And one of the things we've seen throughout this is large organizations in particular are really not geared up to respond at the pace which has been necessary to deal with some of the issues that we've been encountering through COVID-19. So what we saw initially were the almost the sole priorities were get the IT working, getting the comms working, because obviously if people are at home and they can't communicate with colleagues, managers, other people within the organization, or indeed, other stakeholders such as suppliers, partners, customers, uh, they can't get much done and if the computer doesn't work or they can't access the server or they can't log in or they need support to get themselves up to speed in a way that they that's more complicated than perhaps in the office, that needed to be done. And a high proportion, very high proportion of organisation got that going pretty quickly. Obviously, many of our customers have had agile working programs, so they had had people working from home or from a coffee shop or an aeroplane or an um, airport, hotel, and so forth. So they would already had some implementation of this anyway. So in terms of our sort of segment, the office furniture, the provisions, the ergonomics for people, um, we saw some organizations realizing pretty rapidly that they had a load of stuff in the office that people could take with them. So some were able to take their office chair home with them. Um, some of them also took their monitor. One of the things we found really interesting actually is how many people are used to having at least one monitor in the office. Even if they're using a laptop, they're either having a separate monitor or they're using the laptop on a stand next to a monitor, so they're effectively running a two-screen system with their laptop, suddenly finding themselves at home with just a laptop. That's been a real issue for many people in terms of their productivity. So some organizations say, take your chair home. Most, however, didn't do that and so the first procurement we were seeing as I say it was around some chairs um, some laptops a bit of a chair supply was for those shouting loudest within organizations but what we also saw because there was no budget was people were buying cheap and particularly in the context of things like laptop stands we found we could easily supply and we continue to be able to easily supply uh, things like keyboards from Bakery Alkhaizen, which are high quality products, really well designed, really good function, but 50 to 60 pounds each typically in the UK. Whereas people would say, oh, I'm not paying that, I can get a keyboard on Amazon for 10 pounds. And um, not realizing that those keyboards at about 10 pounds are pretty dire and actually won't really help your productivity at all. So we're seeing there is a sort of sweet spot around the 20 to 25 pounds for keyboards. They're not as good as the 50 to 60 pound models, but they do offer reasonable functionality. You can at least get on and do your work. But those suddenly were going out of stock and cheap mice, similarly, you'd be able to get them and then you wouldn't be able to get them. Complete nightmare of actually trying to fulfill customer orders and keep them informed because we just couldn't get information from suppliers about what availability was and what timescales for delivery might be. We've even, we have a laptop stand configurator, uh, a laptop stand kit, configurator page on our website and we actually took away brand names for the cheaper products and we're just talking about standard mini keyboard or standard wireless mini keyboard or standard mouse and standard wireless mouse because we get the best we can get within the budget at the time the order is placed we're trying to hold stock but obviously it fluctuates quite significantly so those were the sort of things we were seeing for the early stages of rabbit in the headlights 
what we then started to happen, and obviously organizations are working at different paces to get to these stages, we call phase two getting a grip. This is when organizations, first of all, realized that actually this was not going to be a few weeks, it was going to be very much longer. And so we're finding there's no longer the active and inactive, it's actually all the responsive and those, the, 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 the proactive and the reactive. Now, actually, everybody's having to move into the more proactive stage because they recognize that we're going to have people working from home for quite a lot longer. Many organizations now are saying uh, to high proportions of their home working employees, quite possibly you're going to be working at home till the new year. September is widely quoted. January is probably equally widely quoted as a, as a possible option. So what organizations are now doing, and these three phases, they're not distinct. There's bits going on where they are getting a grip bits going on where they're still rabbit in the headlights. So as we move on to phase three, some organizations are sort of bouncing back and forth between phases two and three according to how things are going. So what we found is organizations are now starting to get people saying, I'm uncomfortable, I can't carry on working, we've got to do something. We also, I'll come back to it, but obviously the mental health issue is becoming more and more of a requirement so to address. So what we found in early stages of getting a grip was organizations starting to say, right, we have individuals, they've already got problems. Perhaps these were individuals who had musculoskeletal issues at work, maybe they had a specialist chair or equipment. Now these people were starting to find they had the same problems arising at home because they had no equipment at all. So we're starting to get quote requests coming in, first of all, for individual products, for individual employees. Then organizations in the getting a grip phase have started to say, right, we know we have a need for a particular type of chair or a particular, uh, most commonly, the biggest issue we are now encountering is people saying, I just can't work on a dining chair any longer. I've been 12 weeks or whatever it is on a dining chair and it's just too much. I can do the odd hour, I've done it in evenings in the past. So we're now getting not only people who've had problems and had specialists, advice or equipment in the workplace in the office but now saying actually i've never really had any problems at home uh, or out, out of the office or indeed never really had any musculoskeletal problems at all but i'm now saying i've got backache i've got shoulder ache neck ache is driving me crazy i need to take something so what we're seeing coming out of that is organizations are starting to say or have started to say and many have actually done this process and got on with it they're looking at what products they need and therefore they're identifying specific approved products, maybe at a particular price point or a particular individual employee requirement, specific identified products where they say, okay, these are approved. If somebody, our first fix, if somebody has a problem is we'll be going to this chair or laptop kit or sit stand adapters until literally this week and as at now it's the 18th of june when i'm recording this um, we've only just this week started to go back into people's homes to do installations and setups we've only been doing doorstep deliveries prior to that and obviously we are equally starting to go back into offices so we haven't been doing sit stand desks during lockdown that's now an option but historically we've been doing sit stand adapters so we've been doing a lot of example for example a lot of business with the Ecotron work fit z because it fits in better than most of the sort of very commercial looking products for domestic use it's light enough for one person to pick it up and put it down and so a lot of people are wanting something they can just put on their dining table or a table to use standing part of the time so or employers are now saying, okay, this is our approved chair or our approved family of chairs. This is what people will normally get if they want a laptop kit and where we need to have people getting sit-stand adapters, we'll provide those and this is what it will be. So organizations aren't all doing that. Some are doing just laptop kits, some are doing just chairs. So it varies across, but people are identifying needs, sorting out what needs to be done, and putting processes in for rapid procurement, because speed is the real deal on this. What we're finding now is people are saying, look, I want something, I've been putting up with this, I just need to get on with it. So we developed a portfolio of products that are available within a week for home delivery, some of them we're also doing more bespoke products made to order within a couple of weeks. 
And as an, an illustration of that, we have one particular product that is available all in black within seven days, or actually we have a variety of back, back colors that we can do, fabric color, uh, mesh colors rather, sorry, um, that we can do in three weeks, and we haven't sold a colored one yet. Everybody says, there's no price difference, so it's not about price. People are saying, how quickly can I get it? And we're saying, one week for black, there's I think six other colors you can have in three weeks, and they say, no, nope, black will do, job done, thank you. So that's where we're seeing things happen, and speed throughout this, response speed, has been absolutely an issue. And we've been daily evolving, not only the product portfolio, but the method of delivery of products to clients. Obviously circumstances have been rather more, have been very different to normal. Um, but also updating and tweaking our website constantly to just respond to what employer and individual needs are telling us are, are required. So I mentioned earlier, mental health has become a real issue and so what's quite interesting about that is I think first it's really valuable that historically prior to COVID there was a genuine recognition about the importance of mental health some of the social stigma was starting to be broken down obviously members of the royal family very active in that so uh, what we would seen certainly in the UK was people were being able to I wouldn't say the stigma had gone completely and it's obviously very much a cultural issue within organizations and amongst individuals but we certainly had seen that many of the uh, old problems that had risen about getting to talk about the topic or raise the issue were gone so it's fortuitous or, or important that we'd actually that was done before we got into this and so mental health has been more of a subject. Uh, regardless of workplace issues, what you'll have seen in the press, on the news, on TV, um, in the papers, is and certainly on social media and LinkedIn and everything else, lots and lots of stuff about the importance of mental health, about what the issues are and how um, critical it is to take account of that. And organisations are starting to recognise how much of a deal this is. And what's come out of that that I've noticed, I think we were, we, prior to COVID, we were dealing with lots of organisations who had agile working programmes and home working obviously was always part of that. But looking back, it was sort of just one of the things, there was an enormous focus in the workplace because that's where customers come, business uh, partners, suppliers, where people want to come somewhere that they love to work. So there was a lot of attention to designs around things like activity-based working. So there were breakout areas, soft zones, town hall zones, a lot more attention to catering facilities, all of those things in the workplace. And it's now very clear to me that a lot of the organizations who are really good at that in, in the workplace are not so geared up for thinking about the issues related to home working. So what we've seen is whereas home working was part of agile working and frankly not something that was given a lot of attention proportionally, what we're now seeing is home working is a thing in its own right, obviously, and that is bringing different issues. And what's interesting for us with that is we are getting into conversations with organizations at much more of a strategic level where perhaps in those same organizations we were really sort of the partner to the occupation of health and health and safety team dealing with problems as they arose in a reactive role we're now finding organizations are turning to us for their home workers because we we understand the nature of home working and all the issues around home working much more than their mainstream furniture supplier who may be really knowledgeable about the pods and soft seating and, and, the, and the look of the place and all those other considerations which you know frankly the office scenario is not very relevant at the moment, or I'll come back to that though in phase, in phase three. So what we're seeing about homeworking is actually, it's much more complicated than the addressing the needs of an individual in the workplace. First of all, obviously it's about that individual's physical, mental and social needs, that's absolutely the case, but there's much more to it than that. So the environment they're actually in, how much space have they got, 
we're currently not seeing it, but I think as this evolves further, we'll see style becomes more important. So people, as I say, at the moment, they're saying, if you've got it in black, I'll have it in black. But I think we will be moving quite soon where people are actually given a bit more time to think about it. And we are seeing some organizations just saying, we're not getting involved in chair purchase. We're just gonna give you a budget. Obviously Google um, got global press for saying they would award everybody a thousand dollars to spend on. And I don't know, I know nothing about Google we don't deal with them so I've seen the press I don't know when they're uh, putting rules into that recommending products or whether they're just saying here's the money do it but I've certainly come across other cases of very big organizations just saying here's a few hundred pounds uh, most recent case was 400 pounds go and buy a chair and not exercising any more constraint on it than that other than budget so there's an issue of course with that with organizations you have a duty of care to your employees if you give them money to spend so if the company is paying ultimately for products then you have a responsibility obviously about those products and if they go and buy something totally unsuitable uh, where do you stand with that and that's a big issue which i think we will start to see coming further down the line but obviously the other thing about the environment for an individual is what furniture do they have? Do they have a table big enough to work on? Do they have any table at all? Are they currently working on a sofa or um, you know, in, a, in an attic room? How accessible is it? What headroom space, light, really important consideration. What's the view like? Is that uplifting or is it depressing? All of those issues are really key parts of the home working thing. And then the absolute issue that I'm coming across constantly with people, there are inevitably elements around, um, are you sharing a flat or an apartment? How much space is there? Are people working or furloughed? What's everybody doing in that community that you live in, whether it's family or housemates or whatever. But the thing we're finding really hitting people is a homeschooling issue. I've seen in today's paper, the 18th of June, that there's now pressure from GPs to say, get children back into school for their health, for their education, for their well-being. But I'm seeing it from the other side. Parents, most parents, I would say, have pretty much struggled. I don't think anybody's found it. I've certainly not met anybody who's found homeschooling easy. The pressure it places on domestic life, on the ability to work while that's going on. So if you're working and trying to do your job while supporting homeschool, schooling, particularly if you're a single parent, must be a complete nightmare. And I know lots of people have really struggled with the demands of homeschooling. And obviously that dramatically impacts productivity when you're working at home. But also what it impacts actually is your mental health. And indeed the mental health and the general stability and well-being of the entire family. So that's been a really big deal. And then the other thing we've seen in Getting Grip is lots and lots of talking about all these different topics, about what other things we need to be thinking about, how we're going to address it, how we're starting to get some systems in place, people starting to inquire about call off orders for large numbers. So they're starting to realize that actually the, um, uh, that, that, that they, they've got to have a consistent, cohesive plan and really good communications and systems. So it's all very well saying people can have this particular chair or they can be equipped for this or we'll provide them mental health support or we'll offer them physiotherapy. But actually that needs to be clearly communicated to all those people who might need it. And the processes for acquiring that is uh, must be in place as well. Um, classic scenario we have with a couple of key, key customers. I've no idea what their order input screen looks like, but we have two key customers where actually the amount of space they have to put in a home delivery address for an order is often insufficient. So we get orders through with bits of information. Sometimes it's enough to figure out the uh, uh, address, but sometimes, for example, we might get perhaps a number of a street and a postcode, and if we use Google Maps or whatever to check that postcode, with a bit of luck, it gives us a street name, but we still obviously need to confirm that before sending it. So, so we're getting lots of orders coming where we're having to go back to the supplier to email them back and say, can you tell us if this is the right address? Or do you want to make sure it gets to the right person the first time? So there's all those systems and processes need to be put in. Lots of talking, lots of communication. 
And then some of our, our clients now are moving or have moved pretty successfully into command and control. So this is the third phase. This is where you've got a sense of what's going on. You've got a sense of the demands on the, uh, the, 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 the organization from home workers and your return to work, you're starting to think about all of that. But what we have seen in the last few weeks from all those who were lots of talking is quite a lot of silence. I think there are two reasons for that. It's all waking up again. And we've literally had somebody yesterday, I was saying actually at the original, and when I delivered this webinar, literally yesterday morning, we had a substantial order from a client that we've been talking about for a call off for chairs for home workers to have stuff on standby and in stock ready to get out to people very quickly to an agreed specification and price. So we've had lots of conversations, but the last couple of weeks I've gone completely dead. And then Monday of this week, or perhaps it was Tuesday, we got an order through because our contact was back for furlough. So I think there's been two reasons for the silence. One has been that there's been a lot of stuff going on within organisations. So they've got information, they know what these things are going to cost, they can do their budget calculations, they can think about what's required. And so there's been a lot of stuff, although there's been not much coming our way in terms of communication, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the background within organisations. The other thing I think is actually quite a lot of people have been furloughed and within the UK there's been a requirement that if you're going to be on the furlough register and therefore potentially able to be furloughed at a later date as some of the furlough constraints such as part-time working and things get changed, if you haven't been furloughed for at least three weeks by the end of this month, the 30th of June, then you can't be furloughed in the future. So we've seen quite a lot of middle managers being furloughed for three weeks. I assume probably to, well, possibly just because demands on the business, but also to give the employer flexibility in the future if, for example, we get a second wave or how these things change. Now, the big deal about phase three, command and control, is you're fighting on two fronts here. So the demands of home working, which I've covered pretty much comprehensively, are continuing, but you've now got to address the return to work scenario. So how are you going to get back to people in the workplace? Well, spoiler alert, what we found generally talking to people is whatever arrangements they may have in place, it's pretty much unknown for it, be, it to be possible with the current constraints such as social distancing at two meters as it is today that's being talked about but those sort of constraints social social distancing and so forth um getting more than about a third of your people into the workplace for most organizations just isn't possible so what that tells us immediately is if we go ahead with that as an employer, then you're still gonna have people working at home two thirds of the time anyway. I mean, maybe we're gonna be seeing, and I think we potentially are, we're gonna be seeing more redundancies or more people taking more flexible use of the fur furlough. But the simple truth is about a third of your people are being the most you'll get into the workplace for general office space is what we're seeing. And obviously in manufacturing, it's very dependent on the nature of how, what your business does. You might have people working big machines that do a lot of processes and therefore it's probably quite easy to do it. But actually, if you've got a lot of manual labor, then space may be a real issue. So we're seeing organizations looking at the um, return to work. Um, we've seen lots and lots from suppliers about assorted screens to put on the desk for office workers to separate people out products in glass and acrylic and uh, fabric or vinyl covered screens. Um, two comments to make, make on this are quite interesting. First is what I'm seeing for desk screens is lots and lots of manufacturers, more or less all of them, the default height is 600 millimeters. Now, I'm completely unaware of any science relating to this. Um, who says 600 millimeters is the right to hide or not. My suspicion is this is a simply pragmatic choice that more or less all the materials they work with come in sheets at the 1220 millimeters wide. So going six millimeters high, 600 millimeters high gets you two lots per sheet. So I genuinely think that's how they've arrived at 600 millimeters. The other conflict, well, it's not quite a conflict, but it's certainly something that needs to be thought about and discussed if you're going with the screens principle. Um, is organizations are uh, 
needing to consider what the material is they use. From a sustainability point of view, obviously acrylic can be pretty disastrous. There are products, again, I mentioned them earlier, our partners back at and have a recycled product that's 70% recycled plastic bottles when you purchase it and actually can be taken back as 100% recyclable and there's a return plan built in and we're starting to see that. But a lot of acrylic is, you know, it just goes to landfill, unfortunately, when it's done. So apart from the, the upfront cost for this, organizations will probably be saying, well, we don't know how long we're going to need this, but it's probably not, hopefully not going to be forever. So what's our disposal issues there? But the other thing I was going to pick up on about this potential conflict or discussion, all the information we've had through from manufacturers, to my knowledge, has said, and we've had lots, even from manufacturers we've never dealt with, and importers from China, of acrylic, all sorts of people I've had conversations with, they're all saying, go, in, go with vinyl covered screens or acrylic or glass, because they're easy to wipe clean and make sure that with regular cleaning regimes, then it's um, going to be comprehensively safe. Uh, interesting, as an aside from that, we are talking, we've had conversations with manufacturers who've been talking about offering the homework chairs at the moment, or office chairs even, covered in vinyl rather than the traditional knitted fabric, or some are talking about coming up with vinyl covers to go over existing chairs. Now, the paper that the Charter Institute of Economics and Human Factors has recently published, and I'll provide a link and reference to that at the end, this has had... Um, specifically says use uh, a fabric covering for screens preferably because the virus will be absorbed and will therefore will survive less time on the fabric. Now we all know the virus lasts uh, in simple terms it, it's absorbed and lost and, and ineffective more quickly on things like cardboard and fabric than it is on things like plastic and steel. We do know that. We know that the times are quite different from maybe a, a few hours to a few days of the virus surviving, depending what it's resting on. So the fabric idea answers to the point of being absorbed more quickly, but it's going to take a few hours. But the acrylic, glass and vinyl says it's much cleaner, much easier to clean and get rid of with comprehensive cleaning. So I suppose the real question you have is how confident are you about your cleaning regimes that you're putting in place? And that's a question you need to, uh, to address as an employer if you're considering these screens. And it's a really important one because obviously cleaning is something that is a big topic for facilities managers. Even within my own business, we're talking about it, how we can cope with it. It obviously dramatically impacts things like hot desking. People are talking about team A and team B of staffing coming in at different times. So some people never see each other physically with the teams A and B. People don't come into contact so much when they're on the stairs or coming into the building or leaving the building, different lunch times and all the rest of it. But these other issues about the cleaning what are you going to allow people to use or not use? When are you going to clean? How often? What protocols and systems are you going to put in place to make sure no di a different person doesn't use a workstation before it's been cleaned? All that sort of stuff. So this return to work demands are very substantial. And, you know, as I say, frankly, a lot of organizations say, are saying, look, if homeworking is working for you, then it's uh, then, then stick with it, frankly. And so we're certainly seeing that uh, our thinking now is that organisations may be probably, and some are, talking to their people about whether or not they want to come to, back to work because obviously there are the mental health issues of being at home, but the stress of coming back to work. You need to communicate comprehensively to your people what regimes you're putting in place, how you've rearranged the estate, what marking, signage, all the rest of it there are to make sure they are comfortable coming back. Some will be desperately urgent and keen to get back. Others will not want to return. I wonder if we'll even start to see some agoraphobia starting to appear from people with no previous sign just because they've been cooped up or in a sort of constrained environment, however that pans out for them for such a long period. So, need to be thinking about the long-term plan, and, and that's what we're seeing the command and control scenarios in phase three for employers are doing. 
We're seeing a growth in virtual assessments. We've seen a steady trickle, but not enormous numbers of people asking for display screen equipment assessments or workstation assessments in the home. I know some consultants are doing quite a lot, but I think the numbers generally speaking to people I know well where I'm getting the actual sort of levels of business they're doing rather than the sort of public persona levels of business. Virtual assessments are comparatively low. They tend to be the ones um, that organisations say, well, we'll have virtual or remote, but only with um, those where it's really pressing, we'll hang on a little longer. But we're now putting protocols in place along with home deliveries and back to doing desk setups and so forth. We're now pretty much having uh, the, the, the position in place to be able to offer um, assessments, obviously not at really close quarters, but there's potentially ways they can now be done. But I do see virtual remote assessments growing again as organisations catch up. We've certainly got a backlog at the moment of people who said, I don't want virtual, put this in your system and as soon as you can offer a face-to-face -face assessment, please do so. But I think that will evolve and I anticipate a lot more virtual. Excuse me just a minute. So we're seeing, we're seeing also with the command and control organisations, budget approvals now coming through. So conversations that we may have been having going on for weeks or months, we're now saying, seeing people saying, right, we've got that signed off. And as I just mentioned one specific example, we're now seeing purchase orders coming through. Either a constant flow of individual purchase orders, we're also seeing lots of people buying on their personal credit cards or business credit cards, kind of corporate credit cards, or some even just buying it personally because their line manager has approved the um, purchase and then they're going to expense it later. We're also seeing, and I think this will start to grow, but we're actually starting to look at see wellbeing policy reviews because certainly one of the things we're conscious of is that actually, and it's something I've been thinking about for quite a long time, that a lot of organisations have had wellbeing officers, they've had wellbeing policies, they've had wellbeing plans, they've had an ongoing wellbeing programme. But a lot of those, however well-intentioned or well-funded, have been a bit lacking in joined-up thinking. And you know, when I'm feeling my most cynical, I think some of them are, on, are managed on a basis of like, oh God, it's the first of the month on Monday, we've been, oh, we'll do cycle work. What's our initiative going to be? So I think there's been a lot of sort of bits and pieces of stuff that sort of just cropped up almost randomly and not really properly knitted together. And what organisations are now seeing is you really do need an absolutely holistic approach to physical and mental health. And I'm going to mention Champion Health, and with whom we partnered in a minute. Their third thing is social health. So physical, mental and social health, you need a consistent programme to handle that. And um, with Champion, we've actually partnered with them to offer a way of assessing needs to get a better ROI as that evolves. So that pretty much takes us through the three phases. Um, we've, we're seeing people at various different stages of, the, of bits and moving forward. As I say, they're not exclusive. We do find people are in two and then they move into three, but then they sit back into two or they're in three for some, some stuff, but still scrabbling around a bit on two. I think it's fair to say, hopefully, all of the organisations that we know are way beyond phase one, although every now and again they have a little flutter. Um, but generally speaking, this is how we've seen it going. So in response to that, I mentioned we've been doing a load of stuff for obviously changing products. We've been changing our logistics plan so that we can get doorstep or, um, or, or in some side curbside delivery of chairs fully assembled, which historically was something we could easily do. We found ways to do that now. So our way of business has been changing quite dramatically in response, in response to customer needs. And we've got other things coming soon, which we'll be announcing um, separate from our existing stuff. But we certainly see our business evolving more and more. We've always been in the well-being realm, but actually in this more holistic approach to it. So in terms of what's available for you now, there's, as you can see on this page, lots of click-throughs. So um, we will make the PDF of this, we'll, show, we'll link to uh, all of the different downloads that you can get. Uh, we have plenty of stuff, some of which we've written for the current post-COVID-19, post-pandemic or lockdown scenario. So we've various documents written loud for that, both in terms of stuff to download, but also blogs suggesting things about 
physical and mental health, looking at other identities, and other, uh, identifying other things that could be done. We've also got historic stuff about, as I say, we dealt with agile working programs and included home worker programs for, for many years, so stuff related to that. If you are an employee of an organization and you are looking, and you may be in phase two, looking to get a more formal process in phase three, we create a number of landing pages for corporate customers. And this landing page will do a mock-up, a very simple one we can do. So basically we can have a specific URL where employees of an organization will be able to go and have a, a, a clearly defined set of options available to them, either um, training, physiotherapy, products, uh, chairs, laptop stands, so constrain it to exactly what you want them to see. Um, as I say, we're doing a lot of very much customer-led requirement. I mean, we always have, but particularly now we're seeing that um, what we've done historically pretty much is customer-led processes around the processes that we've always had. Um, and what we're doing is expanding all sorts of uh, further options to our processes to meet specific customer needs. I mentioned Champion Health a couple of times. Brilliant guys, you may already be aware that they've made available a free online mental health training program, which is about 30 minutes to an hour. Um, this link takes you through to more details of that. It's completely free during COVID-19, during the pandemic. They've extended it, I think it's on until September, as at the time I'm speaking, uh, 2020. Um, they, uh, but they also have, as well as referring to just now, they have a really comprehensive survey tool, which is something that can be delivered um, to all of your employees. There is a cost for that, but actually what you're able to do is ask an overall fully validated survey series of questions, which give you an idea about two things. It gives the individual a personalized confidential report that nobody else sees to give them help and suggestions for their current, the things and challenges they're facing. It also anonymizes that data into a much big global report for an employer to see what their key issues are across the whole business. And that, of course, makes focusing your well-being spend much more effective. And actually, the ROI conversations, the return on investment for the cost of that, are some numbers that I almost hesitate to quote because they are so good. So it sounds like one of those sort of um, pyramid scheme thing, but it absolutely is. It's a really good system and gives you a really good picture of how things are going. And frankly, not our personal experience, but Champion Health, I'm absolutely confident they've had cases now of actually saving lives from addressing this process and picking up on the needs. So finally, of the, of the freebies, um, CIEHF, the Chance Institute of Economics and Human Factors, I mentioned they're creating a safe workspace document, which was where I was talking about the fabric and so forth for the um, uh, for screens. But their, that document, Creating a Safe Workplace, is a really good comprehensive systems approach to looking at how you're going to get people back into the workplace. So it covers all elements from your analysis, your risk assessment, the processes, how you're going to set it up, your communications, everything you need to have in one single document. I know there's loads of government stuff, and I'm sure you have internal uh, documents that you may be using anyway, but actually as a systems approach, it's really good. They also have another document which actually came out first. There's a little infographic for home workers um, who may not have access to all the fabulous products, obviously, that we offer, or only limited access, or they may be with an employer who's currently in, still in phase one or just still somewhere in the middle of phase two, uh, giving tips and ideas on what you can do to make home working easier and best, get better ergonomics in your home and actually, uh, sorry, excuse me, <coughs> and uh, get a good comprehensive approach to the different postures and things you might be able to do. So that's me done. Those are my details. And uh, I would love to hear from you if you've got any questions, whether you agree or disagree. Uh, in fact, I even almost prefer it if you disagree with anything because I love a good discussion about contentious issues. So hopefully this given me a bit of an overview of what it's all about. And, Keep safe, and if there's anything we can do, help, do to help, please uh, 
do let us know. If you found this valuable, uh, I'd love to hear from you. And do please tell your friends and colleagues and workmates. Thank you very much indeed.